Psalm 96 through 99 this evening, guys. Um, They're short psalms, but they all have the same theme, if you will. That's why I called this evening, I titled this, this evening's teaching, Invitations to Happiness, because that's what they are. They're invitations to happiness. They're that praising God and, and exalting God. And everything that is said in these four psalms, let's see, 96, 97, 99, yeah, four psalms, they are all an invitation to you and I because of what the psalmist claims and what he reads. And it's just amazing to me. And so these, um, Psalm 96, I'll tell you how it starts. Um, psalm 96 begins with, it's up on the screen, sing a new song to the Lord. Psalm 97 is the Lord reigns. Psalm 98 is sing a new song to the Lord. Same as Psalm 96. And Psalm 99 is the Lord reigns. Again, I am teaching from the um, Christian Standard Bible. Your version might say something a little bit different, but that's what my Bible says. So um, they are all pretty much the same. Psalm 96 is a psalm of King David. We can identify that fairly obvious in that, if you do your research, but 97 through 100 is actually anonymous. So 96, 97, 99 for this evening, they are anonymous in their uh, uh, scribing or given to um, any writer to those particular psalms. But I think the one thing that we need to get is not so much who wrote it, but the reason behind it. The writer of these psalms, 96 through 99, The writer is filled with praise, filled with confidence, and filled with victory in the Lord. And I think that is something for each and every one of us, is that no matter what is going on in our lives, no matter how we feel, that, uh, you know what, that we are also filled with praise, confidence, and victory in God. So uh, in Psalm 96, it's interesting as it, uh, as I said, it's a psalm believed to be of King David, and this is taken, the reason why they say it's King David is because if you were to turn, you don't have to do it tonight, but if you were to turn to First Chronicles chapter 16, verses 23 through 36, um, it's practically word for word. So that's why they say Psalm 96 is of King David. It makes sense to me, just personally, because King David is a guy who loved to praise God. He loved to praise the Lord. He loved to exalt the Lord. He he loved to worship God. And so that's why I also believe that Psalm 96 is one that is written of King David or from him. So let me read these verses for us. You guys follow right along. Psalm 96 verse 1 says this. Sing a new song to the Lord. Let the whole earth sing to the Lord. Sing to the Lord. Bless his name. Proclaim his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations. Um, Let's see here. His wondrous works among all peoples. For the Lord is great. And is highly praised. He is feared above all gods. For all gods of the peoples are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Verse 6. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Verse 7. Ascribe to the Lord, you families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord and uh, glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory of his name. Bring an offering and enter his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Let the whole earth tremble before him. Verse 10. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. The world is firmly established. It cannot be shaken. He judges the peoples fairly. Let the heavens be glad and the earth rejoice. Let the sea and and all that fills it resound. Let the fields and everything in them celebrate. Let all the trees of the forest uh, will shout for joy. Before the Lord, for he is coming. For he is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with his faithfulness. So for what the psalmist here, David, is saying, I think it's pretty good because the psalmist commands us, if you will, in the first three verses to do what? My, my version says sing. 
Sing to the Lord. Declare to the Lord who he is and, and, and what he's about. He wants the congregation. That's you guys, all right? He wants the congregation to sing, to praise him, to extol him, to exalt him. You know, I think there's always good reason to praise God. I, I mean, some people look at their lives and they're like, what good reason do I have to praise God? I am sick. I am financially broke. I, uh, I, I'm living in a hut in an island. I don't know, whatever it is. But God is, but, but there's always a good reason to praise God. I mean, how about for the breath in our lungs? How about for um, waking up every morning? How about for having a job? Maybe it's not the job that you want, but for having a job. These different things, we always can sing praises to the Lord. Because you know what? God, because notice what it says here. Sing a new song. I look at that and I say, you know, God, you're showing me something new. You're showing me something different. You know, and, and in that, I think that's reason to praise because God is always going to show us something different or something new to sing about. Maybe it's a new experience. Maybe it's a new truth. Maybe a new beginning or a new open door that God is bringing to us. These all make old songs new or they give us an entirely new song to sing. It's actually a call to worship. That's what the psalmist is doing here. He's saying, sing, sing, declare. So it's a call to worship the Lord for every single one of us. It's the Lord's desire, I think, that all the earth sing and declare for what he's given. It's the Lord's desire that um, it's soon enough that for all the salvation that he's provided for us and the glory of God, we read here, will soon enough be revealed to everyone. We, here in this room, I think can even use the words sing and declare, but also in the phraseology of that, it really means to preach. Not preach is what I'm doing here right now, but preach in the sense of singing, declaring. Because believe it or not, when you declare the praises of God, when you declare the goodness of God, a new truth or a new experience he's leading you into, you are actually preaching. You're declaring. Is that not what preaching is? Preaching is declaring something. And you in your life and me in my life, we're called to declare the things of God. And so really, we're talking about preaching. Our lives are to be full of this type of preaching of the good news, I think. It's, it's from this that we get our words evangelize. The good news that which he has done in our lives. The good news which actually gives you and me reason and it's something to sing and declare about. The next groupings, four through nine, we see that we have a great God and he is really worthy to be worshiped. In verse five, the word idol means things that are written, that, well, I'm sorry, things that are for nothing, things that are weak and worthless. I like that definition. Because I think how many idols I've had in my life. What idols do you have in your life this evening? Things that are for nothing, things that are weak, and things that are worthless. That's the definition of an idol. In fact, 1 Corinthians 8, 4 tells us that we know an idol is nothing. It's God who did all the creating. His presence brought with him all the glory, the splendor, the strength, and the majesty that is befitting with him, it tells us in verse 8. Because of all of these things, these great things, this great God that we have, we're to ascribe to him, as it says in 7 and 8, to ascribe to him all these things, to give him glory and to ascribe to him strength. 
I look in these different verses, 7, 8, and 9, and it will apply to us personally as well. Remember, the Bible always has its historical application to it, but it also has its personal application or spiritual application to us as well, even here in our 21st century. So let's look then in verse 7. He says, Ascribe to the Lord, you families of the people. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. The first thing we see in verse 7 is we're to give to the Lord ourselves. Are you really, and have I really given myself over to God? Holy, meaning all of us, 100% of us? Or are we only giving bits and pieces of our lives over to God? Only you can answer that. Only you can answer what parts of your life you're allowing God into into your own life personally. God God desires like every part of your house and my house that God be involved and invited into every room in your house. Spiritually speaking, the rooms of our heart, the rooms of our own lives, that we're to let him not only in the front room but also in the basement, also in the attic, also in the spare room in the back of the house, in that closet that no one ever goes into. We're to allow and let God into our lives. So as it says in verse 7, ascribe to the Lord, you families of the peoples. Secondly, we're to give to the Lord all glory and strength because of what he does. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Everything that he is, everything that he does, his glory, his strength. In verse 8 then, it says, Ascribe to the Lord the glory of his name, bring an offering and enter into his courts. So give to the Lord the glory of his name, who he is, what he's about. Finally in verse 9, we worship. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Let the whole earth tremble before him. So we give to the Lord ourselves. We give to him the acknowledgement of his glory and strength. We ascribe or give to him the glory of his name. We bring an offering and we then worship the Lord in the splendor or the beauty of his holiness. So important, I think. We're to worship him every single place we go, guys. I don't care where you're at. What you're doing, if you're on the job, if you're in the church, well, especially in the church, or if you're walking your dog, or if you're with your kids in the park, whatever it might be, we're to be worshiping God in all that we do. Maybe you can't audibly do it, but do you worship him in the quietness of your heart when you're at work? Does the Lord bring a, a, a song in your spirit? So that you can just, man, you're just worshiping God in your own way there. Whatever you're doing. All of these things, the writer of of, of this Psalm 96 declares, he is worthy to be worshipped. In verses 10 through 13, we see something that that the psalmist says that the Lord is coming. He talks about the whole world, creation, is looking to the day is looking for that time when the Lord returns. His creation, in a sense, is going to be set free. Set free. And it will welcome its creator. In fact, we're told that even creation groans. And that time when God comes back, man, they will be set free. It will be, in a sense, so blessed. And his righteous judgment or or righteousness will also Uh, His justice will reign. The psalmist in this psalm, as we're going to see in these other psalms, is just plainly overwhelmed. Now there's good overwhelming and there's not good overwhelming, I think. This guy is overwhelmed in a great way, in a good way. He's overwhelmed with the Lord. He's over the top as to what the Lord has done in his life. You know, if we believe, if you here tonight believe the same as this psalmist believes and declares, then you and I would be very willing to tell others about the Lord, wouldn't we? If we were over the top, if we were overwhelmed, 
with what the Lord is doing in our lives or who he is in our lives or what he's done in our lives. Oh man, we would be so willing to tell other people about it. We cannot be just closet Christians and just enjoy our own salvation and enjoy our own private praise time. But instead, we need to be, as the psalmist says to the congregation, sing, sing, declare. That's what we're called to do. Our best sharing. When you share something about God to other people, our best sharing happens when our hearts, everything that is within us, is full of an attitude of gratitude and appreciation for what he's done in our lives. I know that happens with me. And I know some of you here this evening to where when I know the Lord, or you tell me the Lord is doing something in your life, you are just bubbling all over and overwhelmed of what God is doing. My encouragement is don't let that stop. Don't let the things of the world get at you. So much so to where we forget about what the Lord has been doing in our lives all along and who he is. We need to be like the psalmist here and be overwhelmed and over the top about who he is. The Lord, like it or not, has chosen every one of us here tonight to do the singing and to do the declaring. He has chosen every one of us here tonight to do the praising and the extolling. He has chosen every one of us here tonight. Do you guys get my point, right? Every one of you here tonight, your role and my role is to praise God, declare who he is, and sing and be overwhelmed with who he is. That's what we're called to do. Psalm 97. It's interesting. This particular psalm picks up, well, no different than Psalm 96. It picks up in the previous psalm, and the psalmist now expounds more. He kind of concentrates, instead of the people, he concentrates more on the nations. So the people of God, the nations under God. Psalm 97, verse 1 says this, The Lord reigns. Let the earth rejoice. Let the many coasts and islands be glad. Verse 2. Clouds and total darkness surround him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Fire goes before him and burns up his foes on every side. His lightning lights up the world. The earth sees and trembles. The mountains melt like wax at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the Lord of the whole earth. Verse 6, the heavens proclaim his righteousness. All the people see his glory. All who serve carved images or idols Those who boast in idols will be put to shame. All the gods must worship him. Zion hears and is glad. Judah's villages rejoice because of your judgments, Lord. For you, Lord, are the most high over the whole earth. You are exalted above all the gods. You who love the Lord hate evil. He protects the lives of the faithful ones. He rescues them from the power of the wicked. Light dawns for the righteous. Gladness for the upright in the heart. Be glad in the Lord, you righteous one. And give thanks to his holy name. Verses 1 and 2 of Psalm 97 begins again with just the Lord reigns. He's speaking specifically more so now about his throne about how the Lord is on the throne. You know, no matter what goes on in our lives, God is always on the throne, right? We might forget it in our humanity, in our humanness, and we actually ask the question, Lord, do you actually know what's going on in my life? Do you actually know what's happening to me right now? Well, know this. He does know what's happening to you right now. He is on the throne, and, 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 and no matter what goes in our lives, we're to know and believe that the Lord reigns. And he reigns not just over our lives, but the whole entire world. The Lord reigns uh, everything about us and everything that goes on around us. He is there. The Lord is in control. 
And his authority and his power goes way beyond just you and me. You know, it's interesting. Israel was called to be a light unto the Gentiles. Well, I'll tell you this. The church of today is also to be a light, but a light unto the world. That's who we're to be. Although, you know, we can't fully, fully understand everything that God does. That's why the psalmist says in verse 2, clouds and total darkness surround him. It's like, it's, it's not that he's dark and gloomy. It's just that there's mysteries about the Lord that we have yet to understand and comprehend. And so even in that uncomprehending of who he truly is and the depth of who he is, he is still on the throne. Because we can know for certain, you can know for sure that also on his throne is righteousness and justice. And as the psalmist says, he always knows what to do and he always does it right. Isn't that true about the Lord? He knows exactly what to do. And everything God does is always right. I would challenge anyone here in this room tonight or anyone on the street who knows the Lord and say, did God ever make a wrong decision for you? Did he ever lead you to, down a path that set you up, threw you under the bus? Did he ever set you up for failure for the sake of failing or just to get at you? Of course not. Everything he does is perfect. Everything he does, and you may not think of it right now in your life, but everything that's happening to you tonight, everything that's happening in your life at this point, he knows what's going on, he knows what to do, and God is always right. So many times God will allow these things in our lives, even though he's on the throne, and he wants to grow us, he wants to mature us, he wants us to depend on him more. All of these things are for a purpose and for a reason. He's just not rolling the dice up in heaven and seeing what happens. It's all for a reason, folks. It really is. In verses 3 through 6, the psalmist then recalls or writes about the fact that the Lord has power and the Lord is powerful over every one of his enemies. And the picture that he speaks here is that of when Moses goes up to Mount Sinai and, and, and meets with the Lord. I happen to have just been there in my devotional reading. So it's really fresh in my mind. All the people and all how they were fearful. And they said, no, 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 Moses, you go. You go, man, because we're seeing thunderings and lightnings and all of these things. And as we've been in the book of Revelation, it also reminds us that the Lord will come again to judge the world at his second coming. In verse 5 of Psalm 97, that seems to be, in, in my opinion, the, uh, the, 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 the main thing about this particular psalm. He says, the mountains, mountains melt like wax at the presence of the Lord. At the presence of the Lord, he says it twice, of the whole earth. The first Lord that he exclaims, that he says and proclaims is the name Jehovah. The second Lord that he proclaims is is a derivative of where we get the, our name, or the name Adonai. It's interesting with Jehovah, meaning eternal, self-existent God. He addresses him by who he is. He's an eternal God. He's a self-existence God. Wrap your mind around what self-existence actually means. I thought about it for about two minutes and it was like, I can't explain what that actually means. Self-existence. That second word in the Hebrew is Adon. This is again where we get the word Adonai. But it means sovereign. It means master, controller. 
The idea is a meaning to rule. So he not only identifies him by his name, by who he is, he's the eternal God, but he is also the God who rules. So many of us come to the Lord and we're like, Lord, you have saved me, but are you actually, do I actually want you to oversee my life? Do I want you to rule over my life? You see, the psalmist here, I believe, is identifying him in both of these ways. One of which he is eternal. He is God. And the other is, is that he is my master. He is my ruler. That makes it way more personal, I think. That's where that word Adonai comes in. It's, a, it's like, my Lord. You know, yes, you are, you are God and you are eternal. You are self-existent, but you are also my Lord who I want to rule over my life. Who I want to know every part of me. Verses seven through nine, we then get into the fact that there is no God that compares to the God. God, little g, that is, right? No false God, no craven, graven image at all, no idol. Now, it used to be, back in the days, and uh, commentators say here that, you know, um, he could have been writing about the time to where there was some kind of captivity and speaking about idols. Because when one nation overthrew another nation, back in these days, the, the nation that was overtaken would believe that the other nation's idols were more powerful than their own, and that's why they won. Yet according to the Jews, Jehovah God is more powerful and is the God over all the earth. That's what the psalmist says. Yet we do know, even in the history, right? The history of the Jewish people that there have been times to where they have been placed into captivity. There have been times where they have been disobedient or they didn't trust the Lord they, for whatever reason and they ended up in captivity. They digressed in their worship of God, in other words. But then God comes in impossible odds and delivers them. So, so God can do the same. In our own lives, against impossible odds, God can also deliver us from that situation. Think about it with the Israelites. When their backs are up against the Red Sea. Think about it also when uh, they were held in captivity uh, and then finally let go. When they were surrounded and then the Lord sends an angel and just obliterates a whole army around them. Those are impossible things by man. Man could not accomplish those things. Only God can. And, and so our faith is so important, guys. And knowing the things that God can do. Knowing he is powerful. Knowing he is all-knowing. And, and that he is on the throne. This whole thing of idolatry being in captivity. And we can also say that, well, I understand the captivity of those that we've read about in the Bible. But know this, that there is also a captivity of today. We might find ourselves captive, not like a nation, like to Egypt or Babylon. But we're in captivity, I think, to something Every one of us here tonight is in captivity to something. Captivity of worshiping the God of money, the God of power, the God of possessions, the God of sex, the God of pleasure, the God of recognition. Some type of idolatry of our 21st century. That's what it boils down to. It's the same song, it's just in a different tune. Whatever we serve, Warren Wiersbe says this, whatever we serve and sacrifice for, that's what we worship. Whatever we serve and sacrifice 
for, that's what we worship. Is that not true? Can we not look at our own lives and say, man, I can think of those times, those things of which I sacrificed for, those things of which I served for. Those are the things that we worship. Those are idols. Matthew 4.10 says, Then Jesus told him, Go away, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only who? Him. Serve only the Lord. Nothing else, no one else, but serve God You see, if we desire, I really believe this, if we desire to please the Lord, the result is this, that our desires then will line up with His desires. Will they not? If I'm always seeking God and wanting His best for my life, then my own desires will line up with His desires for me and my life. Otherwise, it's chaos. Otherwise, it's in opposition to what he wants because then I'm doing what I want to do and the way I want to do it and how I want to do it. But instead, we seek him. We seek to please him, thereby lining up what we want with his wants. Then we'll want what God wants. We'll love what God loves will hate what God hates. Our lives, then, I think, will not only be God-centered, but God-pleasing. And when we focus and we are God-centered, then it will always be God-pleasing. Let's get into Psalm 98. It's interesting, this psalm, as, as, as I studied for it this morning and I found some interesting things about it. It's quoted that Isaac Watts, I didn't know who Isaac Watts was. Maybe some of you smart people do, but I didn't. But this is a quote that I found. Isaac Watts was, okay, he didn't, okay, they didn't name Watts in LA after him, I'll tell you that much. I thought, Isaac Watts? Maybe that's who they named? No, Southern California thought. Isaac Watts was arguably the most prolific hymn writer of his day. He is known for writing such timeless hymns as Behold the Glories of the Lamb and When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. But he's best known for what? Kerry, do you know? Okay, that's all right, because I didn't know either. We're in the same camp. Joy to the world. Joy to the world. Right, 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 right. The Christmas hymn that we sing every single Christmas. Isaac Watts wrote that. That's what he's best known for. But he wrote all these other songs as well. Joy to the world isn't a Christmas hymn. Joy to the world is a, a kingdom type of hymn, I think. Because it speaks of the second coming of Christ. If you really look at that hymn, Isaac Watts was so overwhelmed with God and he was so over the top with the Lord and he was like so anticipating the coming of his Savior that he writes a song about it and there will be joy to the world because of it. I find that amazing. I love these little tidbits that I find. The psalm is meant... This Psalm 98. Oh, it's meant to to, to praise the Lord for his great triumphs for Israel. And we have words in this Psalm that are like this in verse 1 that the Lord performed wonders. Verse 1 that won him victory. Verse 2 made his victory. Verse 3 seen our God's victory. On verse 6. Trumpets and the blast of ram's horn shout triumphantly. I mean, are, in, are those not like words of like triumph and victory? And man, yeah, we took the hill and, and we did it, man, for the Lord. This is no doubt to me a psalm that speaks of God's salvation. Then, with the Israelites, 
in their time, in the present for you and me, but also in the future is end time salvation. As we've been studying through Revelation, we know that there are those who are the tribulation saints. They come to the Lord, even in a time of great tribulation. So the salvation that God has that that we read in the psalm spans the entire existence of mankind. One through three, let me read it for us in Psalm 98. That's where I'm at, right? Psalm 98. He says in verse one, sing a new song to the Lord. Sound familiar? Yes. For he has performed wonders. His right hand and holy arm have won him victory. The Lord has made his victory known. He has revealed his righteousness in the sight of the nations. He has remembered his love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen our God's victory. Let the whole world shout to the Lord. Be jubilant. Shout for joy and sing. Sing to the Lord with the lyre, with the lyre and the melodious song. With trumpets and the blast of a ram's horn, shout triumphantly in the presence of the Lord our King. Verse 7, let the sea and all that fills it, the world and those who live in it, resound. Let the rivers clap their hands, let the mountains shout together for joy before the Lord, for He is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world righteously and the people's Fairly. Oh man, how great it is that we can read even in the first few verses about his wonderful salvation. The psalmist writes about the Lord's demonstration of his power that they had witnessed or they had seen. It was such a sight indeed for them to behold all of this before themselves. They needed then a new song to be sung says the right hand and the holy arm have won him victory, the power of God. Then it also says that he has remembered his love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen our God's victory. So we see the power of his, of his right hand and holy arm tempered and balanced with his love and faithfulness to his people. Ultimately, I see this as the cross. I see this as that's where victory truly exists, is at the cross, at Calvary. Because that is where he had remembered his love and faithfulness to every one of us. And because of that, we have this amazing, wonderful salvation as a result of that. Though he is powerful, his right hand and his right arm are powerful, he chose a whole different way to bring us into salvation. Israel had been a witness to all of these amazing signs, all of these amazing wonders, all of his power, and a witness of his faithfulness to his promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. His love was his motivation. His faithfulness was his action. Wrought out of his love, he was faithful. That was what he did. That's how he demonstrated his love, by being faithful. The very promises that God gave to Israel and to us is that of what we would call and consider complete redemption. There is nothing lacking in the satisfaction of his sacrifice. There is nothing that wanes, nothing that is diminished in the complete satisfaction of his death on the cross. And the complete redemption by God was through Jesus Christ. And that was the perfect sacrifice. God, listen, God sent his son to fulfill the promise. The promise of salvation. The promise of redemption. 
God sent his son to fulfill that very promise. The remembrance, Luke 172 says, he has dealt mercifully with our fathers and remembered his holy covenant. God remembers what he says. All God did was based on his faithful promise to us. That's all he did. Not on anything we did or anything that we will ever do. Because we know that redemption, salvation, does not come by works, but it comes by faith, by grace, by a promise fulfilled through his son, Jesus Christ. Finally, now in Psalm 99. Man, we've... We're told the Lord is, 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 is in this sense here as we've been studying with, with all of these different psalms all the way going to 93. So nine, Psalm 93, Psalm 95 through 99 and including 100 of which we'll get to next time. They're all what are called royal psalms. And these psalms, these royal psalms speak nothing but of magnifying God and his sovereign rule. Okay? Okay. Remember, we're in book four of the five books of Psalms, and contained in this book are the royal Psalms. They are meant to magnify God, and they are meant to um, speak to us of his sovereign rule in our lives and over the earth. The psalmist in this Psalm 99 tells all about the throne of God and encourages the people, you and I, that we are to worship him and we're to exalt him. Again, it's the same theme throughout, is it not? It's the same thing with these particular songs. That's why these are invitations to happiness, man. These are invitations to a joyful life. And when we, when we are doing this in our lives, man, this, I think we should probably have a song 96 through 97 kind of, kind of a, a pump up every, every few months because we forget to praise the Lord. We forget to exalt Him. We forget He's on the throne all the time. We forget the power that He has. We forget all of these things. Sometimes we need that spiritual booster shot to help us out to remember And in this here, the psalmist is saying, don't forget who he is. So let's read it. Follow along with me. Psalm 99, verse 1. The Lord reigns. Let the peoples tremble. He is enthroned between the cherubim. Let the earth quake. The Lord is great in Zion. He is exalted above all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awe-inspiring name. He is holy. Verse 4, the mighty king loves justice. You have established fairness. You have administered justice and righteousness in Jacob. Exalt the Lord our God. Bow in worship at his footstool. He is holy. Moses and Aaron were among his priests. Samuel was among those calling his name. They called to the Lord and he answered them. He spoke to them in a pillar of a cloud, a pillar of a cloud. They kept his decrees and his statutes he gave them. Verse 8, Lord our God, you answered them. You were forgiving, you were a forgiving God to them, but an avenger of their sinful actions. Exalt the Lord our God. Bow in worship at his holy mountain, for the Lord our God is holy. These first few verses, 1 through 3 of Psalm 99, I believe it tells us and shows to us that the Lord is merciful. We're told that the Lord is between, I think that's what it says, the Lord is enthroned between the cherubim. When I see this, I have the picture of the ark. I have the picture of that mercy seat that sits upon it in Exodus 25. Here's where the Lord said to Moses in Exodus 25, verse 22. Exodus 25, 22. I will meet with you there above the mercy seat, between the two cherubim that are over the ark of the testimony. 
I will speak to you with you from there about all that I command you regarding the Israelites. You see, the Lord at that time was willing to dwell with his people in that way. But he also dwells with his people today. The throne of God is holy. Why? Because he's holy. It can't be anything else. That word holy doesn't mean we walk around with our Bibles and we pretend we got a halo on our head. It's not how we do it. It doesn't matter how many crucifixes we wear or how many Christian t-shirts we wear or whatever it is we wear. It's not even a look. Holy means separate. It means set apart. It means totally different. You understand? Totally different. That means we're not to look like the ways of the things of the world. We're not to act like the world. We're not to talk like the world. We're not to do anything like the world does. But we've been called out. We've been set apart. Another word? Sanctified. Set apart. Why? For his use. That's why. No other reason but for his use and his use alone. Our Lord is holy and he's made a way to dwell in us. Isn't that great? Not a tabernacle. The Lord doesn't dwell in this building. He's here now because you are here. You brought him with you tonight. The Lord be with you and always with you, we used to say in church. Why? Because it's a true statement. He's with you. And he's always with you. In fact, he's in you. And so wherever you go, you take the Lord with you. And that's what we say when he came to dwell in us, he came to tabernacle with us. Set up his tent in us. That's the wonderful thing about the Lord. Our Lord is holy and he's made a way to also meet us and meet our needs through his son Jesus. This is why I believe we can come to the quote unquote mercy seat and not fear for doing so. Hebrews 4.10 is one of my favorite verses and it says, therefore let us approach the throne of grace with boldness that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. That's a great verse to hold on to, guys. It's a real good verse to hold on to. Because that means that you can go to the Lord anytime. That means you can go to the Lord with boldness, with not fear that you've been with him, all, that you've gone to the throne 20 times that day. That's okay. That's no problem. Continue going to the throne of God. Because it is a throne of grace. And it's a throne of mercy. That's what it's all about. We should never be ashamed or shamed or, 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 or guilty or whatever about going to the Lord for the umpteenth time in the day or the week. He wants you to come to him. That's the idea. No one else. He wants you to come to him. That's what he wants. That's what he desires. Verses 4 and 5, we're encouraged as his children not to fear. Hey, the Lord loves justice, but I'm also blessed that he's a fair God as well. Imagine justice without fairness or fairness without justice. The Lord's actions, everything about him, his characteristics are just. And his throne, as the psalmist brings out to us, is also to be the same. And in here also, I look at verse 5, and I think that's also another main point to this particular psalm. It says, Exalt the Lord our God, how in worship, or bow in worship at his footstool, he is holy. This, is, this Psalm 5 is giving, or this verse 5 of Psalm 99 is giving us a, a pattern of life, a pattern of how to worship the Lord. First it says exalt him. 
praise him. Exalt him. All right? That's what we, that's what we do before we get into the teaching, right? We, we praise him. Praise and worship isn't about us. It's not about how we feel. It's not about how worship makes me feel. I, I can't forget, and we can't forget, that worship, corporate worship or private individual worship is one of which we are worshiping upward. Not inward, but upward. We are to come to church to worship God and not ourselves not make ourselves feel good. It's not about that. It's not about how good we sound. It's about worshiping God for who He is and what He's done. That's the sole purpose of worship. The, the guys and gals up here are only to help us in the sense of understanding to bring us into a place of that. But ultimately, it's your worship with God God is not going to judge these folks. He's not going to judge the other folks on worship. He's going to look at our heart individually. Why are we worshiping? To make myself feel good and to get that all, you know, thing, Christian yummy going on, you know, oh man, it's so good, it's so good. No. It, it's, it's to worship God. Too many Christians forget that, that it's about him, nothing about us. So exalt the Lord. Now, when we exalt and praise God, that leads us to the second thing. Automatic, we should bow, bow in worship because he's God and we're not. Thirdly, why? Because he is holy. He's a holy God. He says, be holy because I'm holy. Be separated from things of the world because I'm not of the world. I think these are three things that we should always be doing. We should be exalting him, praising. We should be bowing before him, worshiping. And we should know the reason why. Because he's a holy God and he deserves to be worshiped. For we who are God's people, the Lord's holiness, I think, gives us comfort as we worship Him. There's nothing wrong with that. So I'm not throwing the baby out with the bathwater in worship. It, it is to bring us comfort. It is to bring us some kind of solace. But why? It's to encourage us and to bring us from something. It's to raise us up from something. What? Sin. It's to raise us up out of miry clay. It's to bring us up when our feet feel stuck or our lives feel stuck. And when we exalt him and when we bow before him and we know that he is holy, it's to to do something in us to raise us up. And as we believe in him, we too then are also separated or made holy. These closing verses, six through nine, it shows us that we have amazing access to God You know, Gene and I are watching this series on PBS called Victoria, and it's about Queen Victoria in her younger days, you know, and as she gets older, I guess, how the series is going to go. But you know what? Earthly kings and queens, you have to be a somebody to see them. You have to be a somebody. You can't be a nobody, can you? I mean, it's probably even very difficult for me to go see our own president of the United States because I'm a nobody. But in the world's economy, kings and queens and presidents and prime ministers, you have to be somebody in order to gain an audience with them. Man. But access to the throne of God is always available. It's always there through His Son, Jesus. And we already read in Hebrews how accessible it is. The old covenant allowed priests to to mediate between God and man and man and God. But today, you and I can easily go to the king directly, can we not? Directly we can go to him. And Jesus is our mediator, right? 
Jesus Christ. To the Lord, he doesn't care if you're a nobody in the eyes of the world. Because to him, you're a very special somebody. You're one of his children. How many of you would deny your child an audience with you? How many of you would do that? None of us, I pray. Neither would our Heavenly Father. He's always available for us whenever we need Him. We can come to the Lord, our King, our Father, our Friend, with, with our worship and our praise, as well as our burdens and our needs. We can come to Him either way. Worship and praise or burdens and needs, and he understands and knows. Moses interceded on behalf of Israel. The Lord heard them and answered them, the scriptures declare to us. The premise is still the same, but the mechanics of it is just a little bit different. Today, he speaks to us by his word. He hears our prayers and he answers them. He teaches us and he forgives us when we repent. The Lord heard and forgave the nation of Israel many times as we've read in the past and they still serve him. The holy of holies and the altar of incense, you think about the positioning of where they were. They weren't far from each other. The altar of incense was right there before the, 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 the curtain which led into the holy of holies, right where the mercy seat is. Altar of incense signified our prayers to God. That holy of holies signifies that place where God dwelt. And in that, they weren't far from each other. What does this tell you and me today? Man, today, we can just pray. We just pray. And we enter into the holy of holies immediately. We don't have to be a somebody we already are a somebody according to the king, the real king. In closing, uh, there has to be a response. There must be a response in our hearts to these psalms here tonight. The reason being is because they are psalms of praise and psalms of exalting God. And these psalms teach us and show us how we're to praise him and the reasons why. How do we respond to his access and grace? We worship him, we praise him, we exalt him, we obey him, we serve him, we pray to him, and ultimately, we love him. You know, this is our lot in life, guys. You may think your lot is something else. You may think a piece of the real estate of this world is something else, but let me encourage you here and really kind of like help you with this understanding that our lot in life is to do these things for the Lord. We're to praise Him continually and worship Him faithfully. That's what we're called to do. That is our lot in life. Don't be striving for anything else. Don't desire anything else. Align your wants with his wants. It will never work the other way. He knows what's best. We sing that song often. He's a good, good father. The Bible declares that every good and every perfect gift comes from whom? The father of lights. Comes from above from the Father of lights. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your word tonight. Thank you for these psalms. Thank you, Lord, for the, the jubilation of praise and the excitement of worship, Lord. And also, Lord, the, the, the solemnness of bowing down before you and acknowledging who you are. And so, Lord, tonight I pray that every one of us gets a glimpse of understanding who you are, God, and why you're in our lives. And that, Lord God, that you are the only one worthy to be worshiped. And so, God, we love you. We thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. Thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, 
to fulfill a promise you made a long time ago. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, you guys. Hey, if anybody needs any prayer...